Hello and welcome to Global Eye. I'm Parikshit Lutra. The first major G7 summit agenda reached its desired end in Italy. The nations have agreed on an outline deal to provide $50 billion of loans for Ukraine. This will be done using interest from Russian assets frozen after Moscow's invasion of its neighbor in 2022. US President Biden said that Ukraine will be provided with five Patriot missile defense systems. He said, and I quote, everything we have is going to Ukraine until its needs are met. End of quote. The leaders also shared a light moment as they attended a skydiving demonstration program in a golf course. The Gaza conflict, artificial intelligence, Africa are some of the other important items on the agenda. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has also arrived in Italy. He's scheduled to hold crucial bilateral meetings with G7 leaders over the next few days. It is expected that the Indian delegation will bring up key issues faced by the Global South. This is Modi's first foreign trip since he took charge as India's Prime Minister for the third time. Let me now go across to former Foreign Secretary Kaval Sibyl. We are also joined by strategic affairs expert Brahma Chalani and Ambassador Rakesh Sood, former Ambassador to France. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us on the program. Uh, Ambassador Sibyl, if I can begin with you, uh, what do you think uh, is the importance for India when it comes to the G7 summit? This is also the Prime Minister's first overseas visit. What is the development agenda that we would like to uh, take back or uh, probably have a victory for during the summit? Well, a couple of things. The first time we were invited to a G7 meeting was by France when I was ambassador here um, many, many years ago. And since then, uh, our Prime Minister has been attending the G7 meeting. So it's nothing new. Uh, we are experienced uh, in this regard. Our leadership is experienced. We know what their agenda is. Uh, now, of course, with the war in Ukraine and the uh, war in Gaza, uh, it's very difficult uh, for the G7 uh, to have a positive, a forward-looking, constructive, a peace-loving agenda, frankly. Uh, because whatever they are doing in uh, Ukraine, especially, is going to have, is having great repercussions on the global financial system. This decision to confiscate or to freeze $50 billion, no, uh, $350 billion of Russian central bank assets, which are largely in Belgium, and uh, use mm. uh, the interest on these $5 billion a year uh, to pay off the loan, uh, that uh, mm. loan payment by Ukraine uh, for $50 billion aid to them is, is outright, uh, outrightly against international law. In fact, the uh, president uh, of the mm. uh, of Central Bank of uh, Europe, European Central Bank, Christian Lagarde, has said this is illegal. And President Putin has said that this action will not go unpunished. In fact, this is going to uh, impose a very big blow uh, to the sanctity of the global financial system and will have long-term uh, repercussions. So G7 is actually in a war-mongering mode, is not in a peace-mongering mode at all. And uh, Prime Minister Modi will certainly uh, take on, uh, pursue the agenda that he pursued at the G20 uh, to, to sensitize them on the problems that the global South is facing and which are not going to be resolved or addressed if this is the path down which uh, the G7 uh, mm. want to go. The G7 actually lost its usefulness and its relevance to a great degree after the financial crisis of 2008. And that's how the G20 was raised to the summit level. Mm. But now G7 continues down this path and takes more right. and more actions which are at variance with international law and do not actually have a perspective of peace in Ukraine. And as it is in Gaza, I'm afraid, uh, the task hmm. of our prime minister at, uh, in Italy is going to be very difficult to persuade them to change their course. It's going to be tough. Right. Yes, uh, especially when they want to penalize Russia, they want to punish Ru Russia and hold them accountable. Uh, Brahma Chalani, if I can get you in at this stage, uh, the prime minister had a meeting with Ukrainian President Zelensky as well. Uh, do you think that in the third term, Prime Minister's stand on Russia-Ukraine war is going to change or will be one of continuity and status quo? Why would it change? India has been pursuing an independent approach to international affairs. Ukraine war is just one example of India's independence and neutrality. Why would it change? Because that would militate against Indian interests. 
even if there had been another party in office in New Delhi, India's stance on the Ukraine war would not have been different. The fact is that the G7 member states' share of the global GDP has been on the decline. As the economic strength declines, their global influence diminishes, and the relevance of the G7 itself is being questioned in the West. And to make matters worse, the G7 leaders, other than Italy's Meloni, face winning support at home. Sunak is likely to be gone in three weeks once British elections are over. Macron's future will be decided on June 30th. Trudeau, after eight years in power, has become increasingly controversial and based in autumn, and Biden stays at possible defeat in November. The only leaders of the G7 summit that are strong at home are Maloney and Modi, in a way. It's because of the changing world, the changing balance of power, that Prime Minister Maloney invited to the summit prominent non-Western figures, including the leaders of India, Brazil, Turkey, and the UAE. She also invited Zelensky and the Pope, who, to Zelensky's chagrin, has been calling for a ceasefire. Ceasefire has become imperative, and the Pope can play the role of an okay. honest broker. Unfortunately, what the G7 summit is highlighting is America's and the West's deepening involvement mm. in the Ukraine war. The two important decisions from this summit, one, right. America's 10-year security agreement with, uh, with Ukraine, and the other is a $50 billion loan to Ukraine that will be repaid with stolen interest generated on the frozen Russian central bank assets. So both the steps are not okay. exactly conducive to the West's own long-term interests. Right. Mr. Jalani, I think we're having some issue with your line as well. Your video had frozen for a second uh, on the program. I'll request you to log off and log in. Let me now also go across to uh, Ambassador Rakesh Sood at this point. Ambassador Sood, now keeping in mind the development agenda that Prime Minister Modi has in his third term, what would we like to take away or what is the message that we would like to deliver at the G7? I think Prime Minister Modi uh, would like to focus on some of the achievements of the G20 summit uh, that was hosted by India last year. And among those, one of the key issues would be the global digital infrastructure. That was a major point of focus. And AI, which is part of the global digital infrastructure, is one of the items on the agenda of the G7. Now, frankly, I am not aware as to what the G7 has been able to achieve or what the discussions on AI were in, uh, in Italy. But we do know that uh, there is an EU law on AI that has been adopted. There is also a presidential order, a White House notification that US has put out. Uh, UK had hosted an AI safety meeting last year in November. So there are a number of efforts underway here. Now, whether Prime Minister Modi was able to point to what were India's special interests, because India has its own experience vis-a-vis -vis, uh, digital infrastructure. And we have done certain things which, are, which we have demonstrated are scalable for a population of 1.4 billion. I think that is something which the Global South is interested in. So that would be something. Other than that, I think I would tend to agree with uh, both Ambassador Sibyl as well as uh, Brahma in terms of the fact that uh, on Ukraine or, or on uh, Gaza, there would be very little uh, that we would be able to contribute in terms of peace building or peacemaking. As we know, this meeting, the G7 meeting, is going to be followed by a meeting in Switzerland called the Peace Conference, 
this is supposed to be on Ukraine. President Zelensky will be there. But um, Russia has not been invited. So this is like, uh, you know, being asked to conduct a marriage, one partner absent. I don't know how, um, how it can even be called a peace conference in that sense. So um, that's where I would think is... Right. Okay, uh, let me uh, go across to Ambassador Sybil once again. Ambassador Sybil, now again coming to the meeting with Ukraine. When it comes to the upcoming peace summit, yes, Ukraine wants the Prime Minister to join. Uh, we are still deciding our level of representation for this meeting. What do you think uh, President Zelensky would be expecting from India in terms of the role that India should play behind the scenes? Look, this is a bit ridiculous. Um, India at the prime minister level should not attend uh, the peace summit. Look, uh, of the five BRIC members, uh, original members, four are not going. Okay, China and Russia, one can expect. But Russia has not been invited and China has said no. But Brazil and South Africa are also not going. Uh, and India should not break ranks uh, with the uh, BRICs uh, so easily. However, we've always said that uh, we want a way out of this conflict through dialogue and diplomacy. So even if uh, an effort is being made which is manifestly deficient, but which has as its objective some kind of peace, India should not turn its back on it entirely. And therefore, as we have done in the past, we have, we have uh, participated in the four earlier meetings, we should do it at a senior bu bureaucratic level, at which we should state our position very clearly that you can't have a peace unless Russia is part of the initial discussions. You can't dictate to Russia the decisions that might be taken or the line or the approach that might be agreed in terms of future peace at this uh, summit without Russia. Uh, so it's a non-starter and we should not sully our own uh, uh, position uh, by, by the prime minister uh, going there at all, or the foreign minister going. As I said, we sh it should be at a senior uh, bureaucratic level. And that should be enough because we have also to see what our equities are mm -hmm. with the West, uh, with the United States. Now, J Jake Sullivan is a very right. prime move of this whole affair. And I believe he's visiting India or will visit India shortly. And we have a lot of equities, as I said, with the United States. Therefore, we can't entirely rebuff the United States. So this will be a, a neat way out. It will essentially be a listening uh, uh, participation by us. We will see what the others are saying. And we should stick to our position uh, of neutrality, of finding a balance, of advocating genuine peace and a genuine right. dialogue. And underline that without Russia's presence and active participation right from the start, there cannot be any serious move towards peace. Okay, uh, Brahma Chalani, coming to you on the China question, I think one thing which is occupying a lot of mind space of the G7, apart from the war in the Middle East and the war in uh, Ukraine, is China's trade and economic policy. The large-scale subsidies that China is giving, which is overcrowding and oversupplying global markets with cheap electronic goods, uh, electric cars, electric two-wheelers uh, that they are worried about. Uh, also, China's large impact on global supply chains what do you think will be G7's message vis-a-vis -vis China? The problem for the G7 member states is that because of their growing involvement in the Ukraine war, their space to deal with China is getting constricted. Their policy toward China is so constrained that if you look at Biden's approach, he has imposed no sanctions on any Chinese entity for doing business with sanctioned Russian entities. That's, that underscores the fact that U.S. can ill afford to antagonize China at this juncture, because if China and Russia were to formalize a military alliance that would be America's worst geopolitical nightmare come true. So the deeper the West gets involved in the Ukraine war, the less space they have to deal with China's expansionism or with China's economic 
uh, economic diplomacy and its um, no holds bar trade approach, which is to dump goods, to expand its market share, to, to source resources from other parts of the world. There is very little leverage that the West has as long as it is involved in a growing confrontation with Russia. Right. Let me uh, take a break at this point. When we return, we'll go across to Ambassador Rakesh Sooth about our relationship with some of the key partners we've had bilateral with, including France. What next for the India-France relationship, the India-Italy relationship? We will be discussing that in detail in just a bit. We request our, all our guests to stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Global Eye. We still have with us former Foreign Secretary Kaval Sibyl, Ambassador Rakesh Sood, former diplomat uh, and also Brahma Chalani, strategic affairs expert. Ambassador Sood, our relationship with France. Now, Prime Minister Modi had his first bilateral with President Macron of France. What do you think we can expect from the India-France relationship going forward? There is a lot at stake in the defence sector, uh, in uh, the IT sector as well and education. Well, the relationship between India and France is the first strategic partnership that India established with any country. So it is a mature relationship and uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Macron uh, have met each other uh, regularly. In fact, President Macron was in India for the Republic Day earlier this year. And uh, as you said, there are a whole host of issues which are subject of conversations between the two leaders, as well as the two governments, between the ministries at different levels, foreign ministry, defense ministry. There is the nuclear aspect, there's the space-related cooperation, there is counterterrorism, intelligence sharing, Indo-Pacific, defense ties. I, you name it, there is almost every single aspect of our relationship, we have a dialogue with France. Uh, right now, of course, uh, there are uh, discussions going on with the Rafale Marine, for the Rafale Marine aircraft, for the Indian aircraft carrier, and uh, there are other items as well. However, for President Macron, the crucial thing will be the SNAP election that he has announced. The first round will take place at the end of this month. This is... Uh, coming after the European Parliament elections, where the outcome was something that uh, President Macron felt unhappy about. You had Marine Le Pen winning nearly twice as many, uh, polling twice the percentage that President Macron's party was polling. And I think President Macron felt that uh, he could take a gamble uh, to announce an election so that uh, what remains to be seen is whether he is able to, uh, whether his gamble is successful in the sense that uh, does his party come back, does his party have a rebound, as it were, and he's able to get a majority because right now he's running a minority government, or whether the mood has shifted decisively, in which case, he may be forced into a situation which the French call cohabitation, where uh, you may have a, a, a different party, a, di a prime minister from a different party uh, holding the reins of government in that sense. So that is something that is going to be on President Macron's mind uh, when he meets Prime Minister Modi this time. Right. Uh, let me go across to Ambassador Sibyl once again. Ambassador Sibyl, now, when it comes to India's priorities going forwards, a lot of foreign powers would like to gauge uh, the mood in India and India's uh, political muscle now that the elections are over. We've seen the NDA coming back, but with a reduced number. Do you think this in any way changes uh, India's approach to foreign policy in any way? No, 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 not at all. Uh, not at all. Uh, they, the, these countries are going to deal with whoever is in power. And Modi has come back uh, to power uh, once again. 
and the third time, which is quite an achievement, even with the reduced majority. He, he will be at the helm of the affairs. Uh, the coalition, uh, it, it seems, would be stable. Uh, but leave that aside. As I was said earlier on uh, by Brahma, I think, uh, look at uh, where the other leaders stand. Uh, Sunak uh, is going to be out of power very soon. The Labour is going to come back. Uh, Macron has been weakened very severely uh, by the European elections and has been forced to call uh, for new elections to the parliament. Uh, Biden's future is very uncertain. There are people who think that Trump is going to uh, going to win. Uh, Germany is, is in uh, disarray. It has a coalition government. Uh, Scholz is not particularly strong uh, as a leader. Uh, Maloney, yes, Maloney uh, has some strength in it in Italy, but she is also in a minority, frankly. And there are voices around her uh, which have a different approach to foreign affairs than she has, especially with, with Russia. So what I mean is that these leaders whom I'm talking about are running their countries and we are dealing with them. Uh, we are dealing with them, so therefore they're going to deal with, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Modi in any case, but that's the first thing. The second thing is that India remains important in the larger geopolitical scheme of things for the West, whether it is uh, Indo-Pacific or the rise of China and the consequences of that for India's market, India's growth, uh, India's contribution uh, to uh, uh, technology development, innovation and everything else is human uh, capital, uh, uh, you know, which is valued by the West. Then our position with regard to all climate change discussions, which are very important and very vital for the future of the planet uh, as such. Uh, so all these factors uh, will actually uh, mean that the other countries, other leaders are going to deal uh, with Prime Minister Modi, even if he's come back with the reduced majority, because behind them is India, 1.4 billion people, which is going to be the third largest economy, hopefully by 2027. Mm. By 2030, these are the things that are going to weigh with them. Okay. The fact that uh, uh, that he's come back with a, which is an internal affair. Yes, of course, domestically he may fa face more opposition, uh, and that opposition may want to rope in, uh, you know, the usual lobbies, anti-Indian lobbies, to generate pressure in India. But I don't think that's going to that's going to materially affect India's conduct of foreign policy. Right. Uh, uh, final question to Brahma Chalani. Brahma Chalani, right now we have Italy. Uh, Georgia Meloni, a right-wing leader, she is backing every proposal in support of Ukraine, backing the G7. But you have the rise of the right in the European Union and uh, you have an election coming up in uh, the United States as well. Uh, Labour Party is likely to come to power in UK. How do you think uh, the change in governments across the G7, EU is not a, uh, a member of the G7, but it is a country which participates in the summits. How do you think the, the nature of the elections and the nature of the political mood is going to impact the decisions that the Western world is going to take vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis Israel? The West is at a crossroads. The West accounts for just 12% of the global population, yet it dominates international institutions. It controls international financial architecture. This will change. In fact, there are signs of change already there. And thanks to its own overreach, the West is likely to lose its global supremacy, including its hold on the international financial architecture. And I think confiscating Russia's central bank assets and seizing the interest on those assets has forced a number of countries to think about their own central bank assets. The reason why the gold price has reached a record high is because of the attempt by some central banks to hedge, to diversify. Some central banks are holding gold, but more importantly, in terms of internal developments in the West, we see a rightward shift in domestic politics in Europe, in North America. Britain is probably the sole exception where the Labour Party is expected to come back to power. But this rightward shift 
in domestic politics will have a very important bearing on the West's own future, its involvement in the war in Ukraine. Most right-wing parties in Europe, for example, don't like Europe's growing involvement in a war in a country that is not central to the West's long-term future. So there would be significant policy shifts if this trend towards the right continues. Right. Uh, we've completely run our time, but we'd like to thank uh, Ambassador Rakesh Sood, Ambassador uh, Kamal Sibbal and Brahma Chalani for joining us on the program. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Global Live. But before we let you go, we leave you with these victuals of a brawl that broke out in the Italian parliament amid the G7 summit. This incident occurred during a vote on the controversial government bill concerning local autonomies. The altercation resulted in an opposition lawmaker being hospitalized.